right-handed shot out of Andover, Minnesota. He'll go slow across the blue line. Waits on his forehand, on his backhand forehand, goal! In tight goes forehand, backhand, and the netminer sold out. and welcome back for the second installment of Today in the USHL. I am your host, Kirsten Krull. Now, a lot went on around the league this past week, but first, we're going to start by taking a look at a career milestone reached by one fighting Saint. Here's Sholun at the point for the Saints. Wires one that's blocked off the shin pad of Ryan Beck. Puck kept in nicely by Connor Kurth. Deals it side of the net, hell, and he scores! There it is. History made in Dubuque tonight, and it comes just a minute and a half into the first period, and Stephen Halliday is the tier one scoring leader in Dubuque Fighting Saints history. Thursday night was a night to remember for Stephen Halliday, who became Dubuque's tier one scoring leader, surpassing Shane Sooth with his 145th career point. A big congratulations once again to Stephen Halliday and the Fighting Saints, who would come out on top of the Capitals 6-2. It was also an exciting night for the Green Bay Gamblers who had seven different skaters in the action in the 7-1 victory over the Cedar Rapids Rough Riders. Heading up to Shields Arena, the Fargo Force were host to the Sioux City Musketeers and with just under 30 seconds left in regulation, Knubel netted his 14th of the year and second of the night on the man advantage. Knubel is second of the night. It could be a winner. 5-4 Fargo. Heading over to Green Bay, Cam Lund on the power play would go top shelf far side to bring the Gamblers within one. Down below the line, center cross, shot goal. Cam Lund on the power play. Taking another look at that goal, a little tic-tac-toe to set up the play, and the placement couldn't have been better. Now to Youngstown's home ice. Phantoms up 4-3 over the Lumberjacks, but Jack Williams picks up a rebound and makes it a tie game as he nets his 11th of the season. Kyle Chavette could not find the rebound, and it is deposited into the cage by Jack Williams, his 11th goal of the season, and Muskegon ties the game. Later in the game, just about a minute to go in this one, tied at five apiece. Kyle Bettens is the hero of the night, and I think the only thing better than this goal itself is the celly that followed. Are you not entertained? Kyle Bettens with 73 seconds left in regulation gives Youngstown a 6-5 to five lead. Youngstown would go on to win 7-5, to five, and it was UMD commit Kyle Bettens with the game winner. The Des Moines Buccaneers would take the win in the shootout with a goal from Killian Keeker. The national team development program came to play against the Fighting Saints as 14 players were in on the action registering a point on the score sheet. And Tyler Muszelik stood tall in net making 22 stops for the shutout win. In another exciting matchup, the Fargo Force came back from a 4-3 deficit to come out on top against Sioux City. After going down by one, the Lancers stepped up to the plate and scored three in a row to get the 3-2 win over Tri-City. Over in Green Bay, the Rough Riders lit the lamp on four of the first five goals in the game for the 4-2 win over the Gamblers. Waterloo fans had to have been pleased with the way their team played in the first 20 as three of their five goals came in the first period. Blackhawks would end up coming away with a 5-2 win over the Stampede. And in the final game Friday night, despite a comeback from the Madison Capitals, the Chicago Steel would hang on for a 3-2 win. I will be down in Waterloo this Friday night to watch the Blackhawks as they welcome in the Dubuque Fighting Saints. Puck drop is scheduled for 7.05 Central, and I will be providing exclusive coverage on the Rink Live social media channels. So if you are not already, make sure that you're following us so that you don't miss any of this exclusive coverage. Now, the action doesn't stop here. We're going to step aside for a quick break. But when we come back, we're going to be hearing how excited one college program is to have landed a top prospect. Stay tuned. 
One of the nation's top prospects, Logan Cooley, recently announced that he's going to be taking his talents to the University of Minnesota after having previously verbally committed to Notre Dame a few years back. I chatted with Gophers reporter Jess Myers about just how big of a deal it is for this Gophers program to have landed this recruit. We are now joined by Gophers reporter Jess Myers. Jess, thank you so much for coming on the show this week and some big news breaking the last few days. Logan Cooley switching his verbal commitment from Notre Dame to the Gophers. Just how big of a pickup was this? Okay, so... One thing that's really cool about my job is for the last couple of years, when the Gophers fly, I've been invited and, and the rink live pays for it, but I've been invited to fly on the team charter, which is a fantastic way to travel because, for example, when you're going to Penn State, you go right from MSP to Penn State. You don't have to change planes, any of that. And we have an agreement and, and I, you know, as it should be that anything I see on the plane, anything I hear on the plane is off the record. I'm not looking for scoops. I'm basically just looking for a ride to and from games, but Here's the scene. It's a Thursday afternoon. We're in the air somewhere over Lake Michigan flying to Penn State. And uh, at that moment, Logan Cooley, one of the top prospects, and, and some people have got him going first overall in the NHL draft. Logan Cooley announces on Instagram, he just puts up a Goldie Gopher logo. But this is to signal that he's made his college choice. He's not going to Notre Dame anymore. He's going to come to Minnesota. Logan Cooley, for folks who don't know, is a, a top forward who plays for the U.S. under-18 team. Uh, he's from Pittsburgh originally. So we're on a plane at 30,000 feet. None of us know this has happened. But we land in State College, Pennsylvania, maybe an hour later. I'm in the third row of the plane. Bob Motzko and Garrett Raboyne, the, the two top coaches, are two rows in front of me. We all turn on our phones like you do when you land. And I see the two of them, something big has happened, you know, and, and I'm a reporter. I'm naturally curious what's going on. But again, everything's off the record, so I'm not going to ask any questions. And then I get a text from Garrett Raboyne showing me the Instagram post that Logan Cooley has announced he's going to Minnesota. And there are a lot of smiles on that airplane. Um, this was a really big deal. And talking to my friend, Chris Peters, who covers top prospects in, in American hockey uh, for Hockey Sense, that's his blog. Uh, he said, this is the Gophers' biggest get, we'll call it that, since Phil Kessel uh, announced he was coming to the U of M 15 years ago or something like that. Phil Kessel, of course, was a one and done. He was the fourth overall pick in the draft. He was the most prized forward in American hockey at the time. Logan Cooley is that guy, just a high-end, high-talent forward playing for the under-18 team. They played the Gophers uh, about a month ago in an exhibition game at 3M Arena at Mariucci. They got three goals. He assisted on two of them. Now... This was interesting, too, that I get this news as they're on the way to Penn State because this kid's from Pittsburgh. Knowing that his recruitment was open again, Penn State really thought that they were going to be able to keep him in state and, and get him to be a Nittany Lion. And this was a big blow to a lot of the fans I talked to there and a lot of the folks who cover Penn State hockey that, that they didn't get him because this is a guy that could be a transformational talent. But just a, a, a huge get for the Gophers and really a sign that I think uh, the prospects out there believe in Bob Motzko and believe in the direction he's taking this Gopher program. And that's something else that I was just about to ask you quickly as well. Bob Motzko, a very well-respected coach, has the resume to prove just how smart he is with the game. And he's one of the coaches that a lot of players do want to play for. So uh, getting Logan Cooley, like you mentioned, a huge deal and maybe it's a little too soon to tell, but how do you see him helping shape this Gopher program, especially with head coach Bob Motzko under his leadership? The Gophers, the St. Cloud State Huskies are, are two of just a few programs that still play on an Olympic size ice sheet. That was a big deal in the 90s. We thought everybody was going to go to these big ice sheets. Didn't turn out to be that way. It basically was a, a, an arena fad. But these are two of the programs that have that extra space out there. So it's conducive to their game to get speedy guys who can move the puck. You look at what Sammy Walker has done in his four years as a gopher with that speed on the ice. They just signed a kid named Oliver Moore, who's another just speed demon that, that they're looking to bring in next year out of the USHL. And now Logan Cooley kind of fits that mode as well. You kind of see what style of hockey Bob Motzko is building. It's throw the puck up ice. It's move the puck. It's, it's take shots. It's not quite Penn State where they, you know, get 50 shots a game, but it's also not Notre Dame or it's not Michigan state or ohio state where they play a much more defensive style of hockey and that was the thing that people talked about with logan cooley was 
he committed to Notre Dame back when I think he was about 14, back when you could still do that. Now the recruiting rules have changed and you're not talking to kids until, you know, halfway through their sophomore year of high school. And everybody agrees that that's been a good change for college hockey because it gives kids a little more time to figure out who they are and who they want to be. But it became obvious that the Notre Dame style of hockey, which is a very good, very lock it down defensive style. And that's what Jeff Jackson has always played to some success was just not going to be the right fit necessarily for Logan Cooley. Um, so again, he opened up his recruiting. I know he visited North Dakota. He, he really liked North Dakota and, and talked about that as a potential landing place for him. And again, North Dakota plays that throw the puck up the ice offensive style. But uh, again, just a, a seem to, seemingly a perfect fit for the system that Bob Mosco has, has put together with the Gophers. Just great stuff as always. Thank you so much for your time and look forward to seeing your continued coverage with the Gophers and other prospects such as Logan Cooley. Always great to talk to you, Kirsten. Thanks. Thank you so much. Looking at the top plays from Saturday night, the USNT DP takes on the Chicago Steel. Ryan Fine goes backhand to tie things up with two and a half minutes to go in regulation. This one would end up going to a shootout and USA would get the extra point. Next up, Sioux City at Fargo. Musketeers up 3-1, and they'll go on to extend their lead by 3 with a goal from Ben Steves, who would get a hat trick in this game, and they were and only in the second period. The last couple of weekends for Sioux City. Duran to Steves, and Ben Steves has a shorty and a couple of even-strength goals, and it's 4-1 Musketeers. The action wouldn't end there in this one. Seven minutes to go in the third. Musketeers up 4-2. And who else other than Steves who added one onto the scoreboard for his fourth of the night to make it a 5-2 game. Taking another look from the face-off circle, what a night for Ben Steves. In Des Moines, once down three zip, the Buccaneers would make a comeback and tie things up at three apiece. Bartle waits, slips around his man, fires the shot, and it's in! The Buccaneers have come back storming! Down three to nothing in the first period. We've not yet seen five minutes gone by here in the third. This game would go to a shootout and take a look at this stop right here. What a save from the Stars netminder as he makes a backhand stop. I would put this one in the category for save Middle of the year. Wait, backhand, what a glove save by the netminder. He was beat and put it behind his own back. We saw Andre Vasilevsky rob Andre Kopitar that once in the NHL here at the USHL level. That is a heck of a save. Lots of action Saturday night around the league as we take a look at the final scoreboard from the night. Lincoln Stars hold on to get the shootout win. Ben Steves led the Sioux City Musketeers to a 6-3 win over the Fargo Force. Sioux Falls dominated in their game against Omaha, and the Lumberjacks scored four unanswered to come out on top against the Phantoms. USNTDP won 3-2 in the shootout against the Steel. The Capitals topped the Fighting Saints 4-2, and the Rough Riders shut out the Blackhawks 4-zip to end the night. Another big announcement to come from this past week is news that the World Juniors Tournament is being rescheduled for August. I chatted with Dave Starman, who is on the broadcast team for this event, to talk about the restart. Dave Starman now joins us on the show. Dave, thank you so much for coming on. Looking like you are in a much warmer spot than we are up here in Minnesota. How's it going? Oh, it's it's going great. We are uh, we are in Fort Lauderdale. Our, our son just played in the ECEL All-Star Game and playoffs uh, this past weekend in Palm Beach. And the league offices in Palm Beach, bless their hearts. So we're, we decided instead of going from New, uh, Florida to New York and then to Grand Forks over a span of 48 hours. We would just take advantage of a couple of days of vacation and uh, we'll do our coaches conference calls from down here. I know we just made Pat Pershwell very jealous because we made sure that we set up the camera to look at the palm trees in the background. So we had some fun with that. And I'm sure with Bradbury tomorrow, we'll get some more laughs out of this. And, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's been a good couple of days and yeah, it is 85 and beautiful. Not adding insult to injury at all with that. Here, there's a foot of snow outside and maybe pushing 20 degrees. So not not jealous at all over here. But, but spring, you know, is, spring is not far. 
Yeah, for <laughs> sure. You're a busy guy. You got to squeeze in your vacation time when you can. And speaking right. of being busy, just one of the things that you do in addition to all of the awesome work that you do within the hockey realm is you also have been on the broadcast crew for World Juniors. Unfortunately, it had to get canceled just a couple months ago. But the good news coming out last week is it's rescheduled for August. How excited is are you for this to still be continuing to go on, that there's news that it's going to happen still? And just how big of a deal is it that they're working to make this work again? I think it's great. I, I have often said that I think the World Juniors is the greatest amateur tournament going. I, I think it's it's more unique than the Memorial Cup or the Frozen Four. I mean, those are great tournaments, but the, to me, the World Junior Tournament is special. It's the international flavor. It's the best players in the birth year for you know each country that's coming in. And, and I, here's the thing. I do think that there are ways that we can make the World Juniors even better, which I would be a whole different sideline topic, but I, I'm thrilled that they got this thing rescheduled. My biggest worry right now is with the timing and where it's going to, the time of year it's going to be held, that's going to be just in front of some NHL development camps. And my thought process and hearing a little scuttlebutt going on is with some of the players that would have been involved in the World Juniors to come back for certain countries, they may be under NHL contract by then, and their NHL teams may be saying, well, wait a minute, we want our guys to come to our development camp, and we want our guys coming to our main training camp to make our team, and are probably going to make our team. So in, in that respect, we're not sure that we're going to let them go, but we're going to let them play. So I think that one of the unique challenges of putting this world junior together is going to be who plays and you might see some of the underage players in each of these countries wind up on some of these rosters as opposed to the players that wanted originally because of the fact that you could have some NHL conflict. So I, I, I do think that it's some drama. I do think it adds some excitement and we'll, we'll see how these rosters actually shake out, but here's the bottom line. When they play it, if they play it, wherever they play it, it's still going to be the greatest amateur tournament that gets played. Well, I agree with you 100% on that. But even going off what you just said about how, you know, some of these rosters might change up a little bit with the development camp, it was said that they now can change the team up as well. How much do you think, just if you had to guess at this point, do you expect these to change up? I would tell you this, if, if I played at the national program where I played in the USHL last year and I was a pretty good player, I'd be really excited about how this looks because I do think that the U.S. could wind up with a, a bit of an underage roster potentially. And I do think that opens up the door for some early matriculation of a lot of these kids that eventually would have been on the team to get one more year in. So we may wind up in a scenario where some of these U.S. kids are playing a third world junior tournament because of the fact that they made the team either in their draft year or maybe even before their draft year, just depending on what the depth looks like. And I think that's great for their development, not only as NCAA players down the road, but as NHL players. I think Team Canada is going to face the same deal. I think the Euro is going to face the same deal. And as we've noticed in some of these European countries, they don't mind going a little younger. And I think it, I think it opens the door to a very unique tournament. And based on what we've come out of with, with, players getting extra years, whether they play prep hockey, play in the North American League, play in the USHL, play in the NCAA. I just think the map is all over the place for where players are playing and when. And that, that to me, will be a case study moving forward as to what we might be able to do later on as the dynamics of age grouping changes. For sure. And even rewinding a little bit to about two months ago when this tournament was initially started. What were some of your observations or things that you were seeing from the players and just from the games themselves before it ultimately was canceled? I think the best thing about this tournament is the different styles of play that each team brings in. And you know, I'll go back to last year's tournament for a second. Not, not the one that was canceled, but the one before it. The, the, so the Soviets, the Russians came in, I think Soviets could see Valeriano coach and it's February 22nd, happy, you know, happy 4-3 day. But it, I think back to the way that Larianov had that team playing, and they were playing like the old Soviet teams of the 80s. It was a very puck control possession, kind of like soccer, where they didn't mind if they took 20 shots, but there were going to be 20 good ones, and there's a ton of passing and a ton of regrouping. And for a couple of games, including the game where they beat the U.S., it worked. And then everybody figured it out, and, and it didn't work. And then... The game against the slow watch. The slow watch are very unique in their four check because they love to throw a guy behind the net to try to break up that the D to D pass when play went below the goal line to and, and disrupt in a lot of different ways. So you see 
you see some styles that you don't necessarily see at the NCAA level. You see some styles you don't see at the USHL level you, or, or even the even the pro level. And that's why I think the, the U.S. – I think the, the World Junior Tournament is great because these players get exposed to a lot of different dynamics and the coaches as well that very quickly through video and not a lot of practice time, they've got to come up with answers for it. To me, that is a wonderful aspect of player development. What a game Sunday between the Stars and Lancers as Lincoln would go on to win with LeMay netting the game winner with half a second left. Marcellus tries to shoot it back at the right point. One last shot from LeMay. He shoots. He scores! Buzzer beater! This game's over! LeMay ends it here in Omaha! Taking a look now at the league standings, things are heating up as Chicago sits atop the Eastern Conference at 56 points, with Muskegon close behind just two points back, and Dubuque only three points back from taking that top spot. In the Western Conference, Tri-City has been dominating, 10 points ahead of Sioux City for the top spot at 62 points. The battle for the second spot is getting close as Lincoln is only one point back from number two, and the Lancers currently in fourth. That's going to do it for this week's show. Now, for next week, the USHL trade deadline is approaching, and we'll have special coverage for you on Today in the USHL, as I will be joined by guest analyst Pierre Paul Lamru, and he and I will bring you everything you need to know about what's going on and any big moves that may happen. So stay on the lookout for that, and I'll see you guys next time.